Very good evening to all of you. Welcome to our Thursday service. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you tonight for everyone that is online. We love your presence, Lord. And we thank you for your mercy and your love. And your presence upon our lives, we bless you. We thank you. Tonight our hearts are open in humility to receive your word of instruction. We love you for who you are and we worship you for who you are. Thank you, blessed Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You're all welcome to the service tonight. We bless God for keeping you till now. And uh, we're just going to get into the word of God immediately. And we just want to bless God for what is on my heart for you tonight. Um... <laughs> All right, I was going to sing a song, but I'm going <laughs> to probably I'll sing it in the middle or at the end. Okay, uh, just make sure you have your Bible and your notebook. We're going to get into some beautiful things in the word of God and you're going to enjoy the journey that I'm going to take you on because God wants to speak to your heart tonight and to minister to the deepest and most innermost being of who you are praise god and i just want to talk to you about the one thing you need one thing you need that's my message one thing one thing you need and i'm not going to take you the long winded way or even try to keep you in suspense one thing you need is not actually a thing you need god you say, Pastor, I have God already. I know. So do I. But as we go through the message, you will understand. It's because uh, so many <clears throat> people would swear today, if you ask them, if you randomly stop, and forget non-Christians, if you stop any precious saint anywhere you find them, and you ask them, what do you feel you need in life? What is that one thing that you desire in life? What do you need? What do you need? You'd be amazed that you'd find many brothers and sisters who would probably tell you, Pastor, I need money. I need money. I mean, I need money like yesterday. I mean, there are people who would swear that if they got money today, their problems would end. But you and I, if you just take a minute, only a minute, to think about it, you'd quickly agree with me that that's not what they need. That's not what the human soul and the human spirit needs. And that has never been, money has never been the ultimate need of the human life. Neither is it the ultimate problem solver. It's not money. It doesn't matter how many would swear that if, you, if I just had a million dollars, my problems would be gone. No. There are those who have billions of dollars and their problems are not gone. Others would swear if you find a desperate young woman who just wants to get married, she would say, God, I need a man. All I want is a husband. And if you asked how what you need, she would say, I just need if I can only have a husband. I mean, that's how the temporal and pressing desires of the human life can be so deceiving. That because of what you might be going through for a season and for a time, you can easily be deceived that the solution to that is that thing. You having that thing is what you need. No, it isn't. Brothers and sisters, it isn't. I mean, others would swear, I need a job. Pastor, I need a job. If I can only have a job, you could be watching me and you're one of those. If I can only have a job and you feel what you need is a job, what you need is a promotion. It's not money. It's not a job. It's not fame. It's not a man. It's not a woman that you need. You need God. We all need God. And we get it, when, when we get into the, the other side of uh, faith and believing, we will all say, but we have God already. Yes, but what is that emptiness? What is that void? 
and all of you can identify with this what is that void that feeling of emptiness that so many christians feel what is that desperate empty feeling in so many what is that dissatisfaction the dissatisfaction that so many christians feel the discontentment the misery in their eyes the look of hopelessness and dejection that tired look on the faces of many Christians. What is that look? You want to quickly rush and say by faith confession, I have God already, I have God. Yes, I know, but I'm telling you, I want to take you deeper than that, deeper than just saying I'm born again. And indeed you are. But what is that that is missing that so many people's joy is not made complete? The peace is not there. The conviction is not there. The certainty is not there. The rest is not there in their hearts. What is it they need? And again, like I said, those who are going through financial need or lack or debt or whatever, they will quickly say, I need money. If I can only have money, I'll be happy. Then they get money tomorrow. And then they say, oh, I wish I, I, wish I had a wife, a woman, a man who understands me, then I'll be happy. Then they get married. And then after they get married, they, wish, I, I, they say, I wish I hadn't married this man. And on and on the story goes. You want to ask the human soul. Soul. What do you really need? And David wrote in the Psalms, One thing have I desired of the Lord. This will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord. To behold his beauty. To gaze upon his beauty. He said, surely in the day of trouble, you will hide me in your pavilion. That man said, one thing have I desired of the Lord. That I may dwell in his presence. Gaze upon his beauty. And if I be in that place of his presence, in the day of trouble, he will hide me in his pa pavilion. And so, the children that carry the love revelation, you've got to redefine our priorities. We've got to redefine our priorities. What is it that we really need? What is it that you really need? Praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to talk to you about. My message is one thing you need. And I'm naming that one thing. Dwelling and abiding and living and stewarding and entertaining the presence of God. Man's greatest, listen, man's greatest need is God. It's not food. It's not a woman. It's not sex. It's not a man. It's not a job. It's not money. Man's greatest need is God. And man's greatest fulfillment is God. If a man can get God, I mean getting God, that man will be fulfilled. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus comes and says, Well, <clears throat> man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. And God designed it that way. God himself designed it that way, that man's greatest need should be God. And that man's greatest fulfillment should be God himself. God himself designed it that way. That men should not find their peace. That men should not find their fulfillment. That men should not find their contentment. That men should not find their rest without finding rest in him. And again, I say that the born again Christian is quick to say, I already found God. But I'm saying, how do you explain so many being so discontented? That's the journey I want to take you on. I want you to consider Adam and Eve as we begin this journey. Adam and Eve. It's profound for us to note that uh, when God created man, when God created Adam, the first being and encounter that Adam ever had, Adam ever saw, was God himself. 
I mean God the Bible tells us in Genesis God made man out of the dust of the earth he molded man he molded man and then the Bible says God breathed into man and man became a living soul he was a molding lying on the ground and I can see God bowing down hovering over the man and breathing into him and that that body receives life the breath of life and blood goes through the veins i mean the body and the flesh the dust becomes flesh and blood runs and the heart begins to pump and the lungs begin to pump and the eyes pop open in man's first encounter first vision the face man sees is god's face think about it god's face man sees god before he sees anything, before he sees the beauty of the creation, before he sees the rivers and the lakes and the seas and the animals and the birds and everything, man sees God. Before he sees the gold and the silver, man sees God. Before he sees the flowers of the field and the singing of the birds and the everything you love seeing today, the man so God and I can almost see God reaching out his hand and give Adam his right hand and picking him off from the ground smiling at him and Adam smiling back he met God he looked in God's face and God's eyes and he saw himself in God and God looked in man's eyes and saw himself in that man because he had said let us make man in our image in our likeness God 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 is the first being man ever saw the encounter with God is the first encounter Adam ever had and from that encounter from that connection the impartation of the God life in that man was amazing 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 we read the story of uh, the naming of the animals and how God created the animals and brought them to Adam. The Bible says to see what Adam could call them. What Adam would call them. To see what Adam would call them. In one by one, multitudinous animals passed by and Adam named them. We used to think that those verses mean and many of you may think the same that those verses mean that and i used to think the same thing that the verses mean that god had not named the animals and he gave adam adam the discretion to name them and the bible says that whatever adam called every animal that was the name of it but it's not adam who named them when you read the verses carefully it says that God brought the animals to Adam to see what he would call them. To see what he would call them. It doesn't say they didn't have names before God. It doesn't say that God hadn't given them names. But he wanted to see what Adam would call them. Just like a teacher who brings a yellow color before the child. To see what the child would call it. Child, what is this color? Green. No, it's not green. It's what, Try again. It's yellow. Yes, you got it. To see what the child would call it. That's what God did. Read your Bible again. He brought them before Adam to see what he would call them. He was testing his creation. And then the Bible says that whatsoever name Adam called each animal, that was the name of it. Again, we took that to mean that when Adam called each animal the name he called it, God said, okay, let us call it that. No. No. That verse again, if you read it, it says, Whatsoever name Adam called, that was the name of it. In other words, the verse confirms that what Adam called every animal, that was actually the name of that animal. In other words, the child sees 
yellow in the hand of the teacher and the teacher says what is this color and the child says yellow and the teacher says yes it is indeed yellow that's what happened with adam and god every name that adam called the animals that was the name and god nodded in approval he said yes i have made a masterpiece this man is indeed like me he thinks like me sees things the way i see them that was adam but i want you to see how adam began made by god and his first encounter first face this is god's face but quickly run forward to god says it's not good for man to be alone and i'm gonna make him an helper and you know the story he takes a rib makes a wife out of his rib and from the reading of the scriptures you can see that he went and manufactured the woman from another corner of the garden some other place you say how do i know that because the bible says that after god made the woman he brought her brought her that means he moved the distance brought her to adam that means he didn't fix the woman from where adam was left adam probably lying here or something went someplace somewhere molded up that beautiful creature and then brought her now before god brought eve to adam i want you to think who is the first person and what was the first face that eve saw just like adam the husband eve's first encounter with any being was with god too because after god has molded her given her life too she opens her eyes too and the first face she sees the face of god the first smile she sees is not the smile of adam for you precious ladies who feel I need a man, I need a man, he would solve, I need a man. No, you don't. Yes, you need a husband, but that's not your primary, that's not your number one need. I'm talking to you about the one thing you need. Eve opens her eyes and the first person she sees ever in life is the face of God. Her husband, same encounter, same story, same testimony. And then God brings her, takes her by the hand. Just like he picked up Adam from the ground takes eve the bible says god brought her he didn't show her like shh, 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 let's go let's go no brought her god i see that loving god must have held the hand of eve and said come with me and taken her to her husband and god joined them but i want you to think that the first person she saw was god here are two men a man a woman not two women not two men please let's correct that no two human beings a man and a woman coming together to make a marriage and each of them has a testimony that the greatest encounter i have had and the first person i ever saw in life was god before i saw my wife i saw god before i saw my husband i saw god that was the testimony of adam and eve and that's how they started their life praise the name of the lord what a way to start a life what a way to start a life and so, God designed it that way. That men should not, that you, precious child of God, you will not find, I mean, think about the ones who have found the money that you want and those who have gotten the husbands and wives that you want and gotten the houses and cars that you want, gotten the fame in the city that you want, and they have all those things, and yet they are still contented. The story of the rich young man in Luke 10 tells a lot. Mark 10. Because the Bible tells us he was a rich young man. Another version calls him a rich young ruler. That means he had money, he had power, he had authority, influence. And he was a young man, vibrant. Obviously, for a young man in that kind of culture and tradition, he wasn't short of a woman or a wife. So let's tick off money wasn't his problem. Power wasn't his problem. He was called a rich young ruler. And having a spouse wasn't his problem yet this young man in another version i think luke not mark but one of the other versions i think it's it's it's, it's luke or, that says he said to jesus after jesus gave him the law obey the commandments he said i have done all these from when i was young what do i still lack what am i lacking that means on the inside of him he felt i'm lacking something i'm missing something I have the money, I have the power, I have the fame, I have the influence, 
I have a wife, I have a family. What? But I feel there is a void in me, there is an emptiness in me. People are not contented without God. And the Christian who has already come in and received salvation and doesn't give time and attention to God is also discontented. I want to take you to Luke chapter 10. One thing you need, if I don't finish this today, I'll pick it up next Thursday. One thing you need, Luke chapter 10. Verse 38, Luke 10. Now it came to pass as they went that Jesus entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. Martha, you know where I'm taking you, right? And she had a sister called Mary which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Mary sat at Jesus' feet and listened to his words. Verse 40, but Martha was come but about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. Martha is busy, cumbered, troubled. Call it distracted. She's distracted. But I don't want you to miss what most people missed for a long time, that Jesus actually came into Martha's house. Meaning Jesus came for Martha. Same way he came for you and me. And why is he pursuing them? He loves them. These are the sisters whom we are told in John 11, Jesus loved Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. So this is a visitation because he loves this family. He loves these women indiscriminately, unconditionally, both of them. The difference between the two of them is how they prioritize it. And we are told he came into Martha's house. The Bible says that uh, he came into the city, into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. It was Martha's house, not Mary's house. So Mary was also a visitor in her sister's house. So Jesus, loving Martha, came to Martha, came to visit Martha, came to give her time, came to give her attention, came to be with her. And this is like God. You know those times in your life when God seems to be visiting you? When the promptings of God are on your spirit? To pray, to spend time with him, to spend time in worship, to lock yourself into a room? He's visiting you. He's tugging on your heart, pulling on your heart. He's visiting you. He's prompting you. When you feel a drawing into the word, into your Bible, he's visiting you. He's saying, come away with me, my bride, my love, my darling. Come away with me. He's drawing you to his word, drawing you to himself, drawing you to worship, drawing you to prayer, drawing you into the closet. Sometimes when you want to turn off the TV or walk away from everybody, lock yourself in, he's drawing you. He's come to visit you. Yes, by faith you say he dwells in your heart. Yes, but there are those visitations when he's drawing you to himself. So he came for Martha. He loved her. And oh, how he wished she would respond and reciprocate his love. How he wished she would see that he had come for her. How he wished she understood how much he loved her. And how much he wanted to spend time with her. And to be with her. And how much he wanted her to spend time with him. He came for her. But what Martha did was to lock herself in the kitchen. Busy herself in the saucepans and dishes and all those things. And Jesus couldn't force her out. But Mary, her sister, comes and sits at Jesus' feet. And yet she's the visitor. She's the visitor. Sometimes we could be in the same meeting, same service, same meeting. And God comes. 
What do you mean, pastor, when God comes, you see him walking in the aisle or whatever? No, you know what I mean. God comes. And yet, some people miss him. But he was there. He was right there. And they missed him. They missed him. Some walk out wet and drenched in his presence and anointing. Others walk out as dry as they came. But he was there. But they were distracted. They were thinking other things. Didn't pay attention. Others walked out with an understanding of him. And others did not. Felt the same way they left. Felt the same demon they came with. Same oppression. Same dejection. Same discouragement and hopelessness. But he was there. It's so just about tuning in and giving him time. Sometimes it's a visitor in a service who says what a service. He says what a powerful man of God you, you have in your pastor. What an amazing ministry you have. What an amazing wow. The visitor and goes through and the children of the house missed Jesus and he was right there. Happened so many times I'm telling you I know that. Happened so many times to so many people. And Martha is missing Jesus but Jesus came for her. She's in the kitchen. And the Bible says, but Mary, her sister, sat at Jesus' feet and heard, listened to his words, the things that fell out of his beautiful lips, the gentle words of life and love. She sat at his feet, not from a distance, sat at his feet and listened. But we're told Martha was cumbered, distracted. And then she complained to the master, Master, don't you care that I'm serving alone? You're letting my sister to sit at your feet and just enjoy you instead of sending her to come and help me. What Martha was doing was not bad, but it's not what she needed. That's what I want you to understand. Cooking wasn't bad. She was probably making chapati and tea for Jesus. Cooking wasn't bad at all. House chores are not bad at all. All those things are not wrong. Taking care of a family is not bad at all. But when all is said and done, he says, one thing you need. There are many good things in life. But few need four things. And when we come to the scriptures, he defines for us one thing that we need, that you need, that I need. God be blessed for your husband. God be blessed for your wife. God be blessed for your children. God be blessed for your job. God be blessed for your car. God be blessed for your house. But one thing that you need, it's Jesus. Presence of Jesus. Presence of Jesus. And she got offended that her sister wasn't distracted with her. And this is when some people think you're weird, that you spend too much time with God. That you lock yourself up with God. That you're such a wanton worshiper and lover of Jesus Christ. That you're not normal. You don't seem to be living in this world. You're not like them. And Peter writes about that. They despise you because you're not like them. But Mary knew. And so when Martha is offended, why don't you tell her to come and help me? In Jesus, verse 41 says, And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, you can tell the, that tone of calling somebody twice, Martha, Martha. It's like Jesus is amazed. There's a consternation in his voice. Martha, Martha. 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 And he says to her, you are careful and troubled about many things. Sometimes being careful is not good. He said you're full of care. That's what that word means. You're full of care. You are careful. You are full of care. And you are troubled about many things. And you think those things is what you need. Because you see, you are careful about your rent. Careful about your bills. Careful about getting married. Careful about your job. Careful about your promotion. Careful about your business. Careful about your career. Careful about your tomorrow. You are troubled and careful about many things. Because you think those are the things you need. Think if I get my own home and house, everything will be okay. Do you have an idea how many millions of people have their own homes and are miserable? 
He says, you're careful and troubled about many things. Many things. I want you to mark that. He says, I'm troubled and careful about many things. Many things. And it shouldn't be so. It shouldn't be so. And then, he says to her, but one thing. That's verse 42. One thing is needful. Needful. One thing is a necessity. Only one thing is a need to you. One thing, only one thing is a necessity to you. The Greek word there is kriya. Necessity. Need. The only thing you're duty bound to pursue. The only business you should mind. Only one. And Jesus says, but one thing is needful. And he says, and Mary has chosen that good part. When he says chosen that, he's referring to that good thing. That good part, which shall not be taken away from her. One thing. And Jesus doesn't go into the details to tell Martha what the one thing is. If she's too slow, she's going to miss it. Like some people miss it. But when he makes reference to Mary, Mary has chosen that good part, which must not be taken away from her. Immediately, you know which one thing she's referring to, he's referring to, because what is it that Mary had chosen? Mary chose to sit at his feet, number one. Number two, to pay attention to his words. Pay attention to his words that fell out of his lips. Jesus said, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. The words that fell out of his mouth were like dew, the dew of heaven. Words of life falling on dry ground. Watering your life. Watering your dry heart and th your thirsty soul. Watering your sick body and bringing healing to it. Watering your tired mind and bringing renewal to it. Watering your weary emotions and bringing revitalization to them. The words that fall out of the mouth of Jesus. Watering your life, your spirit, your soul and body. Causing you to be fruitful, to be quickened, to be blessed, to be energized, to be revitalized. Those words, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life, he said. And Mary sat there listening to those words words wonderful words of life and how many people today are so busy so busy we have these services some people are not tuned on not because there is this is seven o'clock plus it's not that people it's not that everybody is very busy doing something very important and world changing no they are distracted Somebody is pro probably watching another television program, something else, following something on Facebook, or you watching something else on another YouTube channel, or doing something else, distracted. Because to them, sitting at the feet of Jesus, they are like Mary, I mean Martha, distracted. You, who is watching me now and listening to me, are like Mary. You've chosen that good part, and you are wise. And God bless you for that. But many of your brethren, who ought to be probably with us online. I'm sure not everybody is on. Distractions. And those who get distracted are still struggling with those distractions never suffice. They never satisfy. They never uh, fulfill their lives. Whatever they're pursuing seems to be like air in their hands, wind in their pockets, weariness in their hearts. Nothing seems to avail anything. It's like the more they pursue, whatever they pursue, the farther away it goes from them. The farther away it goes from them. The more they pursue money. The more they pursue these things. The farther away it eludes them. Distracted. My child, why were you not? Did you catch yesterday's meeting or service? No, pastor. I was so, I'm sorry. I was busy. I was, I was busy. I was caught up. I was busy. Caught up doing what? What is the fruit that came out of that which had caught you up? What testimony came out of your being caught up? What did you make in that two hours when you were caught up? What happened to you? What value was added to you when you got caught up? Because that's not a good catching up. 
You're not caught up in the third heavens like the Apostle Paul. You're just caught up in something else that is totally fruitless. Have you ever sat down, precious child of God, to think, you bride of Jesus Christ, that every time you say, I miss service because I was caught up? Have you ever thought, sat down to evaluate yourself and say, I actually told my friends, my sister, my brother, my husband, my wife, my pastor, that I was caught up? But if I think about when the thing I was caught up in, what value did it add to me? You'd be amazed. Are there so many things that catch you up and you get caught up in that when you sit down to evaluate the value they added to you, it was zero. And not only sometimes zero, it's actually in the negatives. It not only didn't add to you, it took from you. You know what I'm talking about? It took from you. Why am I talking to you this way? Because I'm a minister of love. Nurturing your love relationship with Christ. Nurturing your love relationship with Christ. Christ loved these two sisters. He loved Mary and Martha. And then their brother Lazarus, he comes for Martha. Mary comes in. Martha is distracted. Love is pursuing you. Love is pursuing you. But are you pursuing love? Are you responding to love? It's like in the song of Solomon when the bridegroom comes and knocks on the door of the bride. It's in the middle of the night. He's come through the rain, the dew. His hair is drenched. Puts his hand through the door, tries to open it. The latch is locked. He calls out to her, open to me, my love, my dear one. I'm all wet and my hair is wet and open for me, my darling. And she says, I can't open. I'm already in bed and I can't get my feet cold and wet and whatever. I can't. She's lazy. She's distracted. She's comfortable in another thing. And then he moved away. He moved away. And when he moved away, she finally picks herself up later to try to look for him and she says, he was gone. He was gone. He was gone, brothers and sisters. He was gone. I'm not saying Jesus is going to leave you. I'm saying that presence, that drawing presence, sometimes when you miss it, it's gone for that hour, for that moment. And it may be a while before you lure him back, before you get him back, because it's gone. He was drawing you into that prayer meeting. He was drawing you into that closet. He was drawing you into that Bible. That moment of worship, he was drawing you. You felt a tug on your heart. You felt a move on your spirit, on your heart. You felt tears were coming to you, whatever, as you meditated on him, maybe at the dinner table, and you felt an urge to move away, but you didn't. He's drawing you. And then when you resisted that, that urge, that feeling, he was gone. And everything dries up and goes dry. Anybody know what I'm talking about? He was gone. And the Bible says, Song of Solomon, the bride woke up and opened the door. My beloved was gone. And then she went out into the night trying to look for him. She got wounded in the streets looking for him in the dark. But he came for her and she didn't respond. This is love. I'm nurturing your relationship of love with him. And Jesus was there for Martha. And Martha is busy. But Mary responds, sitting at his feet, listening to those words. And Jesus says, this good thing she's chosen shall not be taken away from her. Destruction. Many are distracted. They've chosen what they think they need and it's not what they need. So I was asking you, precious people, the things that Oftentimes you give excuse for, oh, Papa, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't catch the service. I, I, I was caught up. Very common phrase. Caught up where? And what value was added to you by the thing that caught you up? But I told you that oftentimes it not only doesn't add value to you because you didn't make the money you pursued, maybe you even... Oftentimes it takes away from you. Why do I say it takes away from you? Because you missed an opportunity to be in the presence of God where value, spiritual value and anointing could be added. Impartations could be added on your life. But because you were caught up in something else, you not only missed whatever you were pursuing, but it actually took away from you something that could have been added to you. In other words, you made a loss because you're allowed to get caught up. Don't do it, child of God. Don't be like Martha. Don't be like Martha. Don't be like Martha. Don't be like Martha. And we live in a time where so many people, Christians are like Martha, distracted. 
distracted by social media distracted by this news and that news distracted by everything else that's going on except jesus the only one who is not distracting them is jesus everything else succeeds to distract them everything else succeeds to get them caught up everything else succeeds in getting their attention except jesus the wonderful savior doesn't succeed in getting their attention but their movie gets their attention their football match gets their attention. A phone call from their friend gets their attention. Presidential election news gets their attention. Everything else gets their attention, but Jesus doesn't. Jesus said to Martha, 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 you're careful about too many things and you're troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that. And now we know what Mary chose. To sit at the feet of Jesus dwell in his presence number one and to listen to his words would you make that your priority i'm telling you one thing you need is jesus and the words of jesus that come the words of life that fall out of his mouth that's what you need that's what you need that's who you need your need is god your need is not money your need is not a wife your need is not a husband your need is not a house your need is not a job those things yes but he said that if you seek his kingdom, his basilea, and his righteousness, the gift he gives, all these things are added to you. That's what he meant. They are added to you. But he says the one thing is him. The one thing you need is him. His presence is the one thing that you need. Praise God. Praise God, beloved. Praise God. She chose it. Mary chose it. And this is what I want you to know. That means it's a choice. Jesus makes it clear. Mary has chosen that good part. It's a choice. It's a choice for you to choose God's presence. It's a choice for you to choose spending time with Jesus. It's a choice because you see, God is a gentleman. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. God is not a rapist. He's not going to force you. No. He gently lures you towards himself. Tugs on your heart. Tugs on your spirit. There are many times I've sat in my sitting room, maybe watching a program, and that tug comes on my heart. And I've quietly walked out of the sitting room and walked into my prayer room, locked myself in, Nobody knows. They think I'm just taking a normal walk and entered somewhere. But that thing came over me. I felt him drawing me and pulling me to himself. And I don't want to miss that moment. And I go. And I don't know what I'm going to say. And I don't know what he's going to say. All I know is that he's drawing me at that hour. In that moment. And I don't want to lose it. I've tested it enough to know when he's drawing me and to respond. If it's dinner, I'll postpone it. If it's anything, I'll postpone it when that drawing comes. If it's an appointment, I'll cancel it when that drawing comes. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to be distracted. There are times I've called my secretary to say, cancel the appointments today, I'm not coming. Or cancel these morning appointments, I'm not coming. When I feel that drawing and God is not wanting me to rush into the business of the day and into the crowd of the day, I'll cancel anything and stay where he wants me to be. It's a choice. It's a decision you make. He doesn't force you. He draws you, but he doesn't force you. He visits you. I want you to understand, he visited her. He visits you, but it's your choice. It's a choice you make to sit with him. Do you understand that? It's a choice you make to sit with him. So many times, I sometimes I visit people, and you know, when you're a pastor and you visit people, people want to fast over you, pass a cup of tea, juice, whatever, and I usually say, Thank God, sometimes I, I visit some people when I'm fasting, and so I say, I'm fasting. So sit down. And then I feel I've quieted everybody and everything. But other times you go visit somebody, dear friend, you want to spend time with them, and they say, Pastor, cup of tea, tea, blah, 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 blah. And I say, you know, listen, forget it. I don't want to give you. No, you see. I'm... And you're like, ah, ah. You see, it's not the most important thing to me. I want to spend time with you. I have one hour with you, and I'm going. 
there are some of those who say oh i'm gonna tell my maid to prepare it i'm gonna stay with you i say okay if maid is preparing it but if it's you uh -uh. it's a choice we are told mary has chosen it's a choice understand that you choose he's not gonna force you some of you wish god would just arrest you wrap you lock the door automatically and force you to be with him no he doesn't do that all he does is to put that gentle loving tug in your heart and on your heart in your spirit and he makes it clear and leaves no doubt in your heart that he wants you in fellowship in intercourse and you choose to reject him or to stay with him mary chose it's a choice a deliberate prioritization it's what you do praise the name of the lord jesus christ what i'm communicating tonight is life changing it's life changing and i pray to god that from today you'll never miss a moment of god's drawing that you'll put your phone on silent when it is service time aeroplane mode when it's service time that of course now we are online and you can't avoid this and that's understandable but i mean physical services that you won't get distracted when god visits because you're in church service whatsapping a friend facebooking a friend and doing all these things and you're distracted and jesus passes you by he says martha you're careful you're cumbered you're troubled and jesus came and passed you by your neighbor got touched by the precious spirit of God and you didn't feel a thing. Your neighbor got healed and you didn't feel a thing. Your neighbor got slain under the power. You didn't get a thing. Everybody spoke highly of the service as they got out. You didn't feel a thing. You're wondering, what are they talking about? They are all drenched in the dew of heaven. You know nothing about it. Yours is like the Sahara Desert. You feel like nothing happened. Distracted. But it's a choice. And as I share this message, this thing is going to happen to many of you. God is going to deal with many of you. He's going to draw many of you even now as I speak. Some of you are just feeling the burning sensation in your heart. Some of you may have tears flowing. You just feel something. Because I know what I'm feeling right here as I share this. And God is dealing with you and drawing you. And he's going to cause you from today to prioritize him. And to be sensitive to that drawing that even if your wife is calling you, your mother is calling you for lunch, dinner, whatever, and you have that tag, you'll say, I'm sorry, I'll come later. It's going to happen to you and it's happening to you even now. It's a choice. One thing is needful, child of God. One thing is needful, bride of Christ. One thing is needful. And Mary chose that good part. And Jesus says, when you choose that good part, nobody, he will not allow anything and anybody to take it away from you. And these are the people that Jesus fights for. The people whose battles he takes on for himself personally because they've chosen him and sat at his feet and sat in his word. This Mary came and anointed Jesus with a costly perfume poured it on his feet having cleaned his feet with her hair anointed his feet with a powerful and costly perfume and they all railed on her and attacked her for being wasteful it's the first time i see jesus defending a person in public he said leave her alone leave her alone he said she's done a good thing to me leave her alone defended her a woman sold out to jesus at the feet of Jesus again, kissing his feet, worshipping him, anointing his feet, giving her all to him. And they rise up against her and she says, he says, leave her alone. He shuts them up. And that's what Jesus does for people like that. People who prioritize him. And you make him your first choice. And you make him your number one. And you put him above everything else, above your wife, your husband, your children, your job, your career, your boss, your everything. And you give him time when he's drawing you. And sometimes you don't even have to wait for the drawing. You just need to probably discipline yourself and, and say, I just want to spend time with the Lord. And you sit down somewhere and wait on him. Even if you don't have words in your mouth, you sit there and close your eyes and say, Jesus, I love you. Lord, I love you. Lord, I thank you. And as you 
sit quietly there, tears will become your language. Speechless. A peace will come over you. A warm blanket will cover you. A warmth will come upon you. And tears begin to flow. You're speechless. But your heart is indicting a noble theme. You can hear your heart knocking on heaven's door. And you, you, you feel that your heart, it's deep calls unto deep. You, you are talking, but you're talking in your heart. And he's talking to you and talking to you in your heart. But you can't verbalize anything because you've sat in his presence. You just go and sit there. You don't have to rumble like a madman or mad woman every time screaming at him. No, just go and sit there. Sit at his feet. And switch off everything else. And lock out everybody else. Those are rich moments, brothers and sisters. Those are powerful moments. And Mary learned to choose that. And those who do that are people who God builds a hedge around them and fights for them. Because like David said that in the day of trouble, because I desired to sit in your presence, to gaze upon your beauty. He says in the day of trouble, you will hide me in your pavilion. That's what happens with such people. So they come against Mary, he rebukes them. They'll come against you and the Lord will rebuke them. They'll rise up against you and the Lord will rebuke them. Devils will rally against you and the Lord will rebuke them. Enemies gather against you and he will rebuke them. Why? You spend time in his presence. You love him. You prioritize him. You put him above everything and anything. I've told the Lord, Lord, you mean everything to me. I love you more than I love anything. I love you more than I love my wife, my children, my everything. And there is not a battle he won't fight for you when you choose the one thing that is needful. And the one thing is not a thing. It's a person. But the thing refers to his presence. One thing is his presence. But what you really need is his person. He's a person. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. John 13 tells us what is the secret of John? John the man who writes and says he's the disciple that Jesus loved what was his manner of life around Jesus? He's a guy who lived exactly like Mary probably better than Mary because he used to walk with Jesus and the Bible, the scriptures tell us in verse 21 when Jesus had thus said he was troubled in spirit and testified and said verily, verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. We are reading John 13 in verse 21. One of you will betray me. And the disciples looked one on another doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning, verse 23, I want you to see this. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom. One of his disciples whom Jesus loved. And Peter therefore beckons to him and says, ask him who will it be? And John asks the master, who will it be? And John gets an answer from the Lord. An answer which Peter didn't dare to ask. But what I want you to see is how John learned to keep that place with God. That place with Jesus. That place with God that we are told there was leaning on Jesus' bosom. The bosom is the chest, the breast. A man leaning and leaning on Jesus' breast. This is a man who knew that Jesus loved him and he knew how to receive that love and to bask in that love and to sit in the presence of that love and not be shy about it that there are 11 other men around him. He was not shy that he's leaning on Jesus. On Jesus' breast, chest. This is a grown man. Yes, he wasn't an elderly man. He must have been a young man. But as a young man, you must realize that it's a young man, the teenagers and above in the 20s who are even more self-conscious. How can I be leaning on another man's breast? But there was John on Jesus' chest, receiving love and giving it back. 
and he's the one who writes that there was one leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. It means Jesus, I mean, John, unlike Martha, John understood this man loves me. And I'm going to spend time with him and sit with him and lean on him and be a child and like a child before him. He's a fellow man, but he's my God. I see God in him. And I'm not going to be embarrassed in the presence of other men. How men struggle to break in the presence of God in church. How men don't want to surrender under the slaying power of the Holy Spirit. How men don't want to weep in the presence of the Holy Spirit because women are watching. How men don't want to lift up hands to worship. How men don't want to surrender and to erupt and cry like children in the presence of God. Men, would you lie? Would you learn from me? Men, would you learn from John? Would you learn from those who went before you? That John is a man leaning on the breast of Jesus in the presence of 11 other men. John leaning on the breast of Jesus. And he leans on him. He leans on him. And only him who, was, who had such proximity could ask the deep questions. Even the, those who were distant didn't dare to ask. The difference between those of us who spend time with, that we can take time to ask Jesus the things others don't want to ask, the things others fear to ask, the answers they could get but they can't dare to ask because they are distant from him. They've not made time for him. They are far away from him. And John is the only one who is trusted by place, by virtue of his proximity and closeness to the heart of Christ. He's told, be the one to ask for us and let us know. John asks, who is it, Lord? Who, who, who is it that will betray you? And Jesus gave him an answer. It's not that Jesus didn't love the other disciples. He loved them equally. But John had, John learned to reciprocate. The others were like Martha. John was like Mary. He loved all of them. Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. But we see that even though he loved all of them, it's Mary at his feet. Jesus loved all the disciples, but even though he loved all of them, it is John leaning on his bosom, in his chest. And it's, he's the one who asks, love talk, pillow talk, whispering in the Lord's ear, Lord, who is it? Who is it, Lord? And Jesus gives him an answer. The one who I give the bread when I dip it in the... What closeness, what nearness... What a cultivation. What a blessing. What an amazing truth. I was touched by the story of the man who was delivered from legion. Precious people, this thing runs throughout the scriptures. It's the one thing that you need. One thing we need. Spending time with Jesus. Spending time with the Lord. One thing you need. One thing we need. One thing I need. You need. Not anything else. Jesus, his presence, time with him. That's what you need. Luke 8 tells us the story of the man, even concerning the man who was delivered from legion. When we take the version from Luke 8, I was amazed when God took me there and reminded me, even though I had read it before when I was preparing this message, and God tells me, did you notice what happened to that man? And the thing that that man did after he was delivered. Luke 8, 35, let me tell you what happened. You read it and you discover that man, after he was delivered, He says, verse 34, when they, when they that fed the, the swine, because the devils had been sweating, sent into the swine, when they that fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. Verse 35 says in Luke 8, then they went out to see, the people in the city went out to see what was done, and look at this, and they came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Imagine that even this man, out of whom 6,000 devils were cast out, for some reason in his heart, in his spirit. You see, there's something in the spirit of man. I told you that man's first encounter when he was made was an encounter with God. There's something in the spirit of man that always desires God and looks for God. And I've come to awaken that thing in you. I've come to awaken that thing in you. I've come to awaken that thing in you. Who had taught this man? 
the whole city and village came and they found the man out of whom the devils were departed sitting at the feet of Jesus. That's not a coincidence. Mary sits at the feet of Jesus. This man is sitting at the feet of Jesus. There was a crowd, but this man was sitting at the feet. I mean, he just got delivered and he said, Lord, I don't want to move away from where you are. He came and sat real close like a child. Real close, in his right mind. He was in his right mind. Clothed in his right mind, but sat at the feet of Jesus. Childlike character. Surrendered character. Childlike. There were other men and women observing him and beholding him. But this man, an adult man, sat at the feet of Jesus. He said, Lord, I want to be where you are. I want to be where you are. Just like that old song sung by Don Moen. I just want to be where you are. Dwelling daily in your presence. I don't, want to I don't want to worship from afar. Draw me close to where you are. I want to dwell daily in your presence. I want to be where you are. Dwelling in your presence. Feasting at your table. Surrounded by your glory. In your presence. That is where I want to be. That's what Don Moen penned in that song. And this man learned it. He learned it. He learned it. You can take that key higher, this son. Glad you got it. That man learned it. You say, who instructed him? It's the spirit in man. The spirit of man knows what he needs. The man who had been bound... He knew, the spirit of man knew what he needed. Sat at the feet of Jesus. says, I love this presence. I don't want to leave his presence. And he sat there. And the whole crowd, the whole village looked at him and marveled. Sitting at the feet of Jesus. And this same man, when you read this account in Mark 5. You, if you go and read Mark 5, I'm sending you to read. When you read in Mark 5, it's so touching. It's so touching. From verse 18 to 19, this man actually asked Jesus, when Jesus was departing, let me come with you. He said, let me come with you. He said, let me come with you. Now read it for you. I'll read it for you. Same story. Same story. Verse 18 says, when he had come into the ship, the same thing we've read in Luke 8 now, we take it from Mark 5, this man who sat at the feet of Jesus, the crowd has come, now it's time for Jesus to go. And this man, when Jesus was coming to the ship, verse 18 of Mark 5, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him. That word is a heavy word for, he asked, but it goes beyond asking. He prayed, he literally begged, he beseeched Jesus that he might be be with him that he might dwell with him that he might abide with him do you see this man's desire that he might dwell with him that he might be with him that he might stay with him he said lord don't leave me don't leave me can i come with you jesus is getting into the ship and this man cries can i come with you let me come with you let me come with you and Jesus says to him, how be it, verse 19, Jesus suffered him not, but says unto him, go home to your friends and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee and has had compassion on thee. And this man departed and began to publish in the Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him and all marveled. But imagine this man begging Jesus, please, let me come with you. Take me with you. Take me with you. How many of us are crying like that today? Lord, don't leave me. Take me with you. I want to be with you. He said, I want to be with you. Jesus says, no, I have an assignment for you. 
I want to have an assignment for you. I've touched your life. You've sat at my feet. Now you're qualified to minister to the others, to serve the cities, and to minister to the cities, to evangelize the world. You've, you've believed on me. I've delivered you. You've believed on me. You've sat at my feet. Now I'm sending you out. Go minister to others. But that man's one cry was, Lord, don't leave me. Take me with you. Take me with you. What's the cry of your heart, child of God? What's the cry of your heart? Could this be the cry of your heart? Would you cry, Lord, take me with you wherever you will? Draw me wherever you will. Draw me wherever you will. Close your eyes. Jesus. I just want to be where you are. Jesus. Dwelling daily in your praises. Thank you, Lord. I don't want to worship from afar. Yes, Lord. Draw me near to where you are. I want to be where you are. Dwelling in your presence. Feasting at your table. Surrounded by your glory in your presence, that is where I long to be. I just want to be, I just want to be with you I just want to be where you are Lord Jesus dwelling daily in your praises I don't want to worship from afar Draw me near to where you are. I want to be where you are. Dwelling in your presence. Feasting at your table. Surrounded with your glory. In your presence That is where I long to be I just want to be I just want to be With you And Lord I pray for every man and every woman may the presence of God fill your heart and your spirit your room your house right now the Lord himself draw you move upon your heart come on north wind blow thou south come upon your field your garden this life every man every woman and draw them to yourself melt their hearts in your presence oh God Melt their hearts in your presence, O oh God. May we all cry like that man, Lord, take me with you. Take me with you. The man who desired that you take him with you. And you only allowed him to move further, to move because he had been at your feet. Lord, grant that every man, every woman, every listener. And Lord, may you cause this message to be viewed by many. 
to be heard by many to be received by many blessed holy spirit cause this message to be heard by many that men and women will learn to reciprocate your love and to understand how much you love them and how far you came to be with them as you walked for Mary, you walked for Martha, and she didn't give you attention. Lord, you walked a long way for us. You came a long way for us. May men and women learn to give you time, Lord. I pray for you that you learn to give him time. The presence of God fill your heart. The love of God fill your heart and your spirit and your soul. The presence of God fill your house and your prayer room from today. The presence of God fill your very house from today. The Lord draw you. The Lord draw you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I want to be where you are. I want to be where you are. Dwelling in your presence Feasting at your table Surrounded by your glory In your presence That is where I love to be I just want to be I just want to be with you cry of our hearts Lord cry of our hearts Lord and we thank you for your rich presence in this service in every home in every house blessed Holy Spirit carry us away on the wings and the winds of your presence Lord and may our lives not be the same May 2021 be a year of great, 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 great experiences, greater experiences in you, blessed Lord. May you move upon the hearts of your beloved and take away the complacency in their hearts, Lord, and move on the heart of your bride and draw them to yourself. Thank you, blessed Lord. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I just want you to repeat these words after me. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for coming for me. I give you my heart. I give you my life. Wash me with your blood. Cleanse me with your word. Today, Lord Jesus, I am born again. And you are my Lord and Savior. Amen. And you've prayed that prayer, you're born again. Please get in touch with us. We want to know how to help you and to encourage you. We want to know how to help you and to encourage you. Get in touch through the emails, through the phone numbers. And you can go ahead and worship the Lord with your offerings and your tithes and send them through the same numbers. But I pray for you that this message will not leave you the same. I didn't finish the message. I'll continue it next Thursday. I'll continue with it next Thursday. But you don't want to miss it. This is what love is about. This is what Jesus came for. And that's why you're born again. You're born of his bones and flesh of his flesh. He's delivered you from so much. He saved you from so much. And his desire is like that you be like that man. All of us be like that man. Lord, take me with you. Don't leave me behind. I want to be with you. I want to stay with you. That's what life is all about. It's one thing. One thing one thing one thing thank you Holy Spirit
Thank you, Lord. When I think upon your goodness and your faithfulness each day, I'm convinced it's not because I am worthy to receive the kind of love that you give. I'm so grateful for your mercy. I'm so grateful for your grace. And because of how you poured out yourself, That the reason I cry out today Himela Himela O kaka O nye kerua Himela Himela Sing with me. Imela, 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 O Kaka, O Nyekeru, Imela. Emela Ezemo You're my Lord and King and I worship you today Who am I to sing your praises? Who am I to sing your song? Blessed Lord, blessed Lord. Blessed Lord. Blessed Lord. It's your blood that has made me worthy. I could never sing your praises. I could never sing your song. But you've made us worthy by your precious blood made us by your precious blood worthy to call upon your name and for this you deserve all our praise worship and attention this is what we give tonight lord jesus it's the cry that nations cities of the world and their kings and nations will be drawn into this worship lord lifting up the worship and praise to you the king of kings and lord of lords who paid a high price for men and women to be saved and to know you that they may know you the only true god and jesus christ whom you have sent for this is eternal life that they may know you that they may know you intimately that they may know you imela o kaka o nyekeru imela Himela Ezemo These are moments when I miss physical congregation because I know what would happen at such times. But I know the Lord has touched you in your home. You would want to listen to this message again. Share it with a friend. Share it. Share it. And because we are online, like it. So click on the like button and share it with your friends. You would want everybody to hear this. And I pray, Holy Spirit, this message goes far for the helping of the so many that are distracted and chasing the wind today. May they all turn their eyes upon you. Turn your eyes. Upon Jesus, look full 
in his wonderful face and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace thank you lord turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of this world will grow strangely deep in the light of his glory and grace turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful face it's a beautiful face lord and the things of this world how they grow strangely dim lord fade away in the light of his glory and grace and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace lord jesus and the things of this earth Lord, they grow strangely dim in the light of your glory, your glory and grace. Thank you for your glory, Lord, and thank you for your grace. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Do you love Jesus tonight? Go ahead and share how the service has ministered to you. Go ahead and share how the Lord has touched you and ministered to you. Just go right in just before you leave. How you've been blessed by this message. And share it with others. God bless you. Love you. I'll see you on Sunday. Bye-bye.